Hi, I'm Adele from The Upcoming. Congratulations on the tremendous response for your third feature film, mm. Never Look Away, which I think is a beautiful and fantastic oh, piece. Of thank you, Adele. This is a good start to the interview. <laughs> thank you. Here you go. Um, firstly, could you perhaps tell us what inspired you to create this wonderfully epic story spanning 30 years of German history and art movement? You know, I, I was looking to make a film about the origin of human creativity because that was always something that I found fascinating. What what makes some people experience something terrible and turn it into great art, what makes other people, you know, experience something terrible and just collapse and, and die. You know, what is that? How, how do you summon that spark that allows you to turn something terrible into something positive? And I first thought that I'd find it in opera. I had this idea that I'd see some composer who maybe, you know, is not very healthy and unlucky in love and he's not a handsome guy or so, but you know, all his misadventures, you know, he turns in his little shitty little apartment, he turns into these beautiful arias, you know, I, I, and I thought it would, be, and then you find them on the big stage and you see his life transmuted into this, you know, acoustic and visual glory on the opera stage. But I looked through this genesis of all of my favorite operas and it was mostly quite banal. There wasn't anything, you know, it was really just, uh, you know, a successful composer who gets sent some bestseller to set to music, you know, or uh, Verdi who loves Schiller and says, I want to make a lot of Schiller plays into operas. There, there, there was never really that, that direct personal connection. And then I heard about something from the life story of a German painter, Gerhard Richter years later he'd done a beautiful painting based on a photo from his family album of his beautiful young aunt holding him as a little baby and um, later he revealed that there was a very personal connection that this aunt had been murdered by the Nazis shortly after the picture was taken um, because she was schizophrenic and that didn't fit into the Nazis idea of you know, the genetically perfect race of the future and so they killed um, hundreds of thousands of people with some kind of developmental disabilities. And that was known and that gave a, a, a face to the victims of this eugenics program. But only in the 2000s when Richter was already in his 70s did a journalist find out that the woman that Gerhard Richter ended up marrying had a father um, who was a high-ranking SS doctor and had been responsible for parts of this eugenics program and in fact had been the director of the very um, hospital where the aunt had been forced sterilized which was the first step to her complete demise and murder and i thought this is a really interesting starting point you know this this duel between these two men who are connected in a way that they don't even know about and you know will the the artistic intuition that the young man the son-in-law is developing or has to develop to become a great artist suffice to unmask his father-in-law you know and I thought that would be an interesting way to just uh, explore explore the development of an artist and the historical details and portrayals are extremely authentic especially with the degenerative art exhibition can you tell us about the research that this perhaps took yeah we had whole team of art historians working with us. We had a production designer who was in charge only of this first scene in, that takes place in the Degenerate Art Exhibit because it was such a massive scene to make. I mean, it's only what, five minutes long uh, in the film, but it was very, very complicated to do because so the Degenerate Art Exhibit was this bizarre thing that the Nazis put on, a massive show where they pulled from the museums all the art that they considered degenerate. Those are you know, some of the most treasured artworks of today, you know, Blue Horses and, and uh, Kandinsky's uh, great work and Franz Marc and Otto Dix and you know, all those great painters. They were, their paintings were taken from the public museums and, were, and, and the ones that the Nazis considered the most ridiculous were put into this show, which was a huge success. Over two million people came to see it. To, you know, the intention was to make fun of it. Of course, a lot of people came because they thought it was the last chance to see great art. And then afterwards, uh, some of these paintings were sold at impromptu auctions and the others were destroyed. So we had to reconstruct a lot of these paintings working with the archives of these great painters and having you know, teams of painters 
rebuild them. I mean, it's in a way a crazy effort for a little scene, but it, it, it seemed like, you know, it seemed like something kind of like a spiritual monument that I wanted to build for them. And uh, the crazy thing is that we now have to, I still haven't got myself to do it, but this week I'm going to do it next week. Um, I have to destroy those paintings now because, you know, they're, they're like forgeries. And uh, so I'm going to have to destroy them again. <laughs> the rest of and, and there's a standout scene early on in the film where Aunt Elizabeth is playing the piano. Mm -hmm. Were you conscious of the subtle way in which her madness was portrayed? Do you have a question how far you could push that scene? You know, it was, of course, with, you know, the... the you know, the Me Too movement, there was a lot of question about the massive nudity and sex and all that that we have in this film. But um, I, I think that, you know, I'm very happy about how all those scenes turn out, both these scenes of madness and the scenes of, you know, the love scenes and all that. Because when you're searching for truth <laughs> and when you're, and this is what this film is about, you can't be prudish you know and uh, so luckily the actors were really game and and and, and s in a way saw what we were doing and uh, I don't know I, I, I just felt if if there was anything in the film that felt like we were being fearful we would not be true to the message you know what kind of work did you do with the cinematographer Caleb um, Deschanel? Were the aesthetics of the film as important to you as the characters? It's, with Caleb Deschanel, the cinematographer, he was such an essential part of this. There were actually two people that I had in mind. Uh, one was the cinematographer and one was the composer. The composer was English actually, Max Richter. Uh, Caleb Deschanel was American and very, very hard to get for people. I know that he passes on almost everything that he's offered in Hollywood. Uh, he's probably the most renowned cinematographer, has been nominated five times for an Academy Award, now six times. Um, and I knew that I needed him because I knew that, the, that our images had to be as strong as the paintings in a way. And he's the greatest painter to me among the cinematographers. And so before I even started writing, I called him and said, look, I want to tell you about a story that I'm thinking about writing, but I don't know if I could write it if you, if you, you know, won't shoot it because there's no point in writing images that I don't think we can somehow uh, get onto canvas, onto the canvas. And, uh, you know, I, I talked to him about, you know, what I admired in the natural, in, uh, you know, the passion of the Christ in uh, the right stuff and, uh, you know, about all, all his work, The Patriot, all these fantastic films that he's done and, and, and said that I, you know, that I needed yet something completely different from him again, told him the story and he said, you know, this is exactly about what I'm most interested in, the origin of creativity, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm in. And then I started writing and knew that, uh, nothing could happen and you know it happened much like that with Max Richter also who said he wanted to create a score here that would not just reach your ears but that would reach your whole body and uh, and, and that would make you know every every part of you shake and vibrate and um, but you know not in a not in a menacing way but just in a very deep and meaningful way and, and it was incredible we recorded this score here at um, um, at the Air Studios, and uh, it was a, a really, really intense experience. Of um, you know, that's one of the most joyful chapters when you know that you have the music right, and then you hear it recorded by an orchestra, and it just becomes real. The whole thing. Uh, so I'd say between Caleb Deschanel um, and uh, Max Richter, protecting these actors. Uh, you know, we, we, we knew we were onto something that would be, that could become good. <laughs> it is good. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much for speaking Thank you so today. much, Giselle.